Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Keller, Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library. On behalf of our partner, Wakeman Town Farm, I welcome you to this webinar. During this past year, many people moved into new homes and all of us spent way more time at home. And with the coming of this spring, visible now in the tops of daffodils and crocuses pushing through the soil, comes the desire to make our yards more beautiful or more eco-friendly or just more. If you're new to your yard or gardening, this all might be overwhelming and make you scroll through the landscaping businesses in the area for a quick fix. But before you do that, Alice Ely will give us some easy steps for assessing your yard situation and starting the process yourself to save you funds and get a clearer idea of what you have and what you want. So at any time, you can type your questions for Alice in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And now, who is this Alice person? If you haven't attended any of her gardening webinars from the past year, you are in for a treat. She is a Yukon Advanced Master Gardener and Master Composter who calls Westport's Wakeman Town Farm her happy place. Alice enjoys teaching homeowners how to garden through gardenwithalice.com. And when she's not in someone else's yard, you'll find her in her own sanctuary, raising lots of milkweed and helping those monarch butterflies. Welcome, Alice. Thank you, Jen. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. And if you didn't have spring fever today, it means you didn't go outside because man, it was beautiful today. And I kept saying to myself, what a good time to give this talk because everybody's gonna be itching to get into their gardens, I bet. So um, tonight uh, we are uh, giving this talk with Wakeman Town Farm and the library on behalf of Westport's Pollinator Pathway. And if you haven't yet heard about the Pollinator Pathway, it is a grassroots organization, which many, many towns in Connecticut and even the surrounding tri-state area are now uh, climbing aboard and forming their own pollinator pathways in town. It is a concept not unlike the green corridor that Aspetuck Land Trust is, is also promoting. And the idea behind it is that we are stewards of our backyards and we are in a unique position to help restore habitat that's been lost. And it's something that uh, creates corridors and pathways for all the creatures who make our ecosystem uh, have a place to forage and get from safe place to safe place. So that's the pollinator pathway. And um, they are uh, behind um, the reason that I give this talk. And uh, without um, further elaboration, I'm gonna take you to the, um, the garden planning. So I'm gonna share my screen. And here we are. Okay, so we're calling this a fresh start toward a greener landscape. And as, and I hit page down and nothing happened. So let me try this other button, see how that goes. Well, let's see, there we go. All right, that's enough of that. Computer behave. Okay, so there's no better time to make a better garden. And as, as Jen alluded to the fact that we've all been spending a lot of time at home, I've never talked to so many people who are uh, excited about taking a fresh look at, at their gardens or tackling that uh, new garden in the house they just bought. So uh, there's never been a better time to take a step back and do things the right way. So the pollinator pathway, the reason it exists is because our pollinators are in big trouble. Uh, the populations of many insects are crashing and uh, it's you reached the point where New York Times Magazine puts it on their cover. The insect apocalypse is here. Uh, there have been dramatic declines since the 70s in 
in the population of insects and also dramatic declines in the population of birds. Uh, this is because their habitats have been lost to development, to pesticide use, to climate change. It's all interconnected. Native species, the creatures and the plants that evolve together are vital to the survival of a diverse ecosystem. So when we start losing one, pretty soon we lose another and then another. Or if a certain habitat is removed, the creatures who depended on that are gone too. So here's where we can all help. Our own yards can replace this lost habitat. We really can. 85% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. And the open spaces that remain, 15% are not connected. So we are the connectors. Creatures cannot get, they can't get everything they need just confined to one open space. They have to have someplace else they can go. Every time we lose a species, we disrupt the food web of the creatures who evolved with it. And chemical laden lawns and yards full of non-natives are food deserts for these creatures. And you may look out at a beautiful yard or even envy your neighbor's yard that's full of this sweeping expanse of lawn and a couple hydrangea bushes. Uh, and in fact, that's a food desert. There isn't very much there at all that can feed an insect or feed the bird who is gonna eat that insect. So when we protect the insects, the pollinators, we support what feeds on them. And pollinators ultimately feed us because they keep a lot of our crops healthy. So that's why we're the stewards. And that's why we wanna get away from lawns that look like this, or yards that look like this. There's just not enough there for creatures to find a home in. So, I'm, uh, you're, you're, you're anxious to start in your old gar own garden, and here I am talking about the science of it, but it's important to understand some key principles because you've probably heard a lot of talk about natives already, and you're wondering, well, does this mean I have to start over? I've got all this stuff growing in my yard. Well, it's about finding a balance, and uh, this is where uh, we are relying on the science that Doug Tallamy, uh, who is uh, the author who really started bringing uh, and this information to the fore and to really started researching what it takes to keep a population of birds alive. And um, he has learned that the threshold is 70%. And what that means is it's okay if not everything in your yard is a native but you wanna aim for 70% of it being native because that is what is gonna give you enough critical mass in your habitat to feed the creatures. So what Doug Tallamy discovered, uh, and he studied chickadees, and he found out that in uh, neighborhoods where there was at least 70% of the species of plants uh, that were growing there were native, there were enough insects who were living on those plants that the chickadees could raise a brood of young. Uh, and uh, something like uh, it takes 6,000 caterpillars to raise a brood of chickadees, an amazing amount. And uh, this is what they have to be able to find and they can't go flying. These are birds, they make hundreds of trips a day back and forth to the nest. So they need the food to be where they are. So with all of that, he, he found out that in neighborhoods where at least 70% of a yard had native species, there was enough forage there, uh, in, there were enough insect larvae there that the chickadees had enough to eat and enough to raise a brood. So when it fell, when the ratio fell below that, they weren't successful at raising uh, large enough brood to replace themselves. And so that's when you start to see populations starting to crash. So this is the takeaway, the important takeaway for us. And you'll see how you can address this in your own yard is you don't have to uh, give up everything if you've got a lot of non-natives. You just need to add more natives. Uh, and, that's, and that's really the key thing going forth. So now we can start talking about what's, what's gonna take place in your yard. So 
keystone natives are the ones that provide the most value to the most creatures. And uh, Talamy created this handy list. And actually, it's going to be in your handout, so you don't have to do not try to take frantic notes now because uh, there's there's a handout with this information in it. But these numbers, these are just the butterflies and moths that can live. The, how many different species can live on one type of plant? Oaks are the stars. They support 462 different species. But little old uh, Joe Pye. Uh, Sunflowers, they also support a lot of different species. Strawberries uh, support a lot of different species. Who knew, right? So these are the kinds of things you can kind of go through your yard and say, oh my gosh, I've got two oaks. Great, congratulations. You've gone a long way to supporting the creatures. So that's what, just keep that in the back of your mind as we talk about what's going on in your yard and how to suss it out, is that this, is a good guide to what you can add that's gonna add a lot of value uh, to your yard as a habitat. Okay, so a beautiful yard and a great habitat? Yes, you absolutely can have both because you know, I'm, I'm the first one to say, I garden because I like beauty. I like beauty in my yard. And I uh, don't think, I think that that's really where the joy of it is for us humans, but the other part of it is what we're doing for the earth at the same time. So now, bad news, it's not time to go shopping yet. I know I've, I've, I've done it. I knew what I was doing when I did it and I did it anyway, but sometimes, especially in the spring, I just go, I head straight over to the, the nursery and start shopping um, without a plan which leads to what we call driveway plants, which is a lineup of pretty plants I fell in love with that I haven't decided where I'm gonna put them. Okay, so that's me. I should know better and I do know better, but it's an easy mistake. So hold off on the shopping. When we get done, you are gonna know what you're shopping for and where you're gonna put it. So that's great too. All right, so starting from the top, the most important thing you can ask yourself as you look out over your yard, as you walk around it looking for what's popping up, what kind of yard do you want? You can look at it holistically, the whole yard, or you might want to focus this year on just one flower bed that you've really wanted to tackle, or maybe the plants around your entryway. So it's really important, and this is the first thing that they tell you in, in garden design is, have your goals in front of you. So are you looking for more light in your yard, prettier views out your windows, more flowers, less maintenance? That's okay too. We all are busy folks. And, um, and unless you're retired and, and intend to spend all your time gardening, you need to be practical about what you can accomplish. So um, more privacy, that's important if you're on a busy street or maybe more veggies. Uh, more curb appeal is certainly something to consider. More color, more birds, more pollinators. Yes, absolutely. So let your goals guide your decisions and your priorities. Now, this is a fun thing that you can do and you can do it on a rainy day even. What do you have now? So this is kind of interesting because thanks to Google, you can take a virtual tour of your yard and very kindly, they took their pictures uh, in, in the summer so you can see exactly where the shade falls, but take a virtual tour, get a sense of the big picture. Now, what I did was I just took, I went, I blew up um, my uh, yard on Google Earth as big as I could get it and uh, still fit on the screen. And I took a screenshot and um, saved it, uh, you know, saved it to go back and then uh, took a physical tour. Take a physical tour around your property. See if you can identify the keepers and the losers just right off the bat. If you're like, oh my gosh, that ugly overgrown shrub is blocking my, my view out the window. Well, that's, a, that's something you, I, I have an expression uh, that I uh, say when I'm working with people is, you gotta rip the Band-Aid off. If, if 15 years ago when your house was built, the landscapers 
plopped some spruces really close to the house to give it a sense of looking established really fast right away, chances are that spruce has gotten way overgrown and probably leggy on the bottom because it wasn't really the right tree to put that close to the house. It just looked good the day the house was built. So uh, those are the kinds of things where you might say, you know, that's got to go. I'll be able to get a better sense when that's gone. That's, those are the kinds of things you're creating a list of what, what your laundry list is and later on you're going to prioritize it. So um, while you're at it, try to assess how much of your yard has native plantings. Now, this is something that you may not know much about, but it's pretty easy to find out. There are excellent references and I'm gonna provide you with some as uh, uh, that are in the take home. So again, you don't have to scribble frantically because it'll be in the uh, handout at the end. But uh, there are excellent references to tell you what's native to our area. Uh, there are excellent uh, nurseries in the area who will also help guide you toward the natives. We'll talk more about that when we get to the shopping part. But at a minimum, uh, assess what you've got Make a note of what's doing well and what's not. Um, you know, take a close look because sometimes you'll suddenly notice, oh my gosh, what's happened to that tree? It's got hardly any um, buds on it. It, it. Those branches look dead. Well, uh, sadly, there are a few diseases that attack trees that there's no coming back from. Uh, you, you may have already lost all your ashes, but if you haven't, I'm afraid that that's a given because the emerald ash borer has just laid waste. Uh, to the ashes in our area. So there may be a few things like that that cannot be saved. Um, so take photos of the focus areas, the things that you wanna think more about that are important to you, that entryway that you would like to pull together or that spot that's really sunny where you think you can put a pollinator guard. Take lots of pictures. It's good to have them. Um, and uh, look through if you took pictures last summer, pull those out too and, and um, you know, put, a, put them all in your folder. Take note of where the sun shines most and least because that's really important. So this, here's what I figured out about this, uh, this property. Um, see the green circles? That's where the native trees are. The red circles are where the not natives are and a couple of them are thugs and really need to be gotten rid of. And that's a process because uh, much as I would like to sweep in and take everything out at once, it would be a huge, huge undertaking. So it's a war of attrition on the stuff I don't want. Um, so this is a really good way. Once I did this, I could see at a glance that I was safe, that I was um, above 70% in my natives. Uh, the biggest circles are the huge, the tallest trees. So those are those are 80 foot tall trees. Uh, oak, uh, there I have several really big oaks and some really big uh, red maples. And those are wonderful keystone species as I was telling you about. And uh, they make, make up for um, a few little flowers that still live in my garden that are not native for sure. So this is the kind of thing that kind of lets you know where you stand. If you're still not sure what you have, and I'm sure there are some mystery trees, et cetera, um, ask an arborist to come and take care of that tree that's in bad shape. And while you're at it, ask for an ID on those mystery trees too. Then it'll be good to have what you've got. There's also some really neat apps such as inaturalist.org and picture this. And they're really fun and a, and a lot of help. Uh, and they're basically crowdsourcing. There are a lot of botanists and scientists who participate in these sites and will help with IDing things. Uh, the other thing is you can ask a knowledgeable friend or if you have a master gardener friend, they are really good resources to help you identify some things that are puzzling you. And you'll feel so much more in control. Um, there's a cool book that I originally found at the Westport Library. I now own a copy. It's called Bark, A Field Guide to Trees of the Northeast. And it is amazingly helpful at letting you identify your trees with just bark because we're still uh, 
uh, about uh, four weeks out from leaves starting to show up. And uh, this is this is really handy, handy tool is the bark book. I, I highly recommend it. Next, we're getting there. We're, get, we're getting to the planning part. There's uh, one more pre-step, as I call it, and that is eliminate glaring problems first. So if you have invasive vines choking trees, get them out of there. Uh, bittersweet is infamous for sne sneaking its way up trees and pretty soon it, it robs them of light and pretty before you know it, they've killed the tree. So you want to get invasive vines. Watch out if you see a vine going up a tree that has hairy roots and no leaves. That, my friends, is poison ivy. That's what poison ivy looks like in the wintertime. So don't be um, super eager to rip the poison ivy uh, off uh, the trees until you're all gloved up. By all means, you can do it, but uh, suit up first and just know that that uh, even touching poison ivy roots can give you a nice case of poison ivy. So uh, scrub up with Dawn soap uh, afterward uh, really well and, and, and throw everything you had on in the wash and then you can get those vines off. Um, overgrown shrubs, uh, now is a really good time to prune almost every shrub unless it, if it is a spring flowerer, hold off, do not prune it now. So that would be, for example, azaleas, uh, lilacs, uh, uh, mountain laurel, things that bloom in the spring, you do not prune in early spring. Anything that blooms later in the season can be pruned now. In fact, it's a really good time to prune. You're pruning them while they're dormant and then the pruning stimulates growth and it really helps uh, uh, shape out uh, plants nicely. So that's a good thing to do. Look out for hazardous dying trees. You can take them down, but here's a tip. You can see this is a snag. It's an oak snag. It's not gonna fall on anybody. It's away from the house, but the uh, woodpeckers and other birds in our yard absolutely love it. So it's always good to leave up a snag if you can do so in a place that is uh, not a hazard to anybody. And I actually had the arborist take the branches off this so that I wouldn't worry about a branch falling down and conking me on the head. So there it is in all its glory and uh, Every year when I hear the woodpeckers going at it, I say, you're welcome. Anyway, so that's that's a snag. Keep the snag if you can. Uh, blighted boxwoods, uh, there's, there's a blight that's attacking most kinds of boxwoods. A few don't get it, but if you see that your blockwood, boxwoods have suddenly turned brown over the winter, bad news, no way to bring them back. Uh, it's uh, what is attacking them uh, it is it will not go away. And so that is going to be something that you're going to want to rip out and uh, uh, replace it with another nice with a nice native shrub. Boxwood's not native. Um, wrong plant, wrong place mistakes. We all make them. And uh, you'll know if you've got a plant that is incessantly trying to lean over something someplace else. That might be a plant that you think about relocating or if it's kind of fugly, rip the bandaid off, it goes. Uh, something else to look out for, if, uh, if you have barberries in your yard, and a lot of us do because they were hugely popular with landscapers, uh, they have, they, um, the Japanese barberries have burgundy colored leaves, common barberries more green colored leaves, they're very thorny, uh, and it turns out uh, Yukon did a study and discovered that white mice, uh, white-footed mice, which are the tick, deer tick vector, disease vector, they hang out under barberries big time. I think it's because they hide under the thorns and they eat the berries that fall down. They're happy. We're not because it creates a tick habitat. They found high, high concentrations of ticks in the vicinity of barberries. Plus, they're invasive species that's been getting into our woodlands. You will see them growing in the wild in um, Aspect Land Trust properties, for example, and uh, it's, they're bad news. So get it out of your yard. It's, it spreads. The birds eat the berries, and that's how it spreads. And uh, you just don't want it there. Who needs a tick habitat close to their house? So uh, out it goes. Volunteer invasive saplings. I made the mistake years ago when uh, we first moved into our house uh, that we 
kind of took a pet. We had a couple saplings coming up here and there. Well, we didn't get around to taking them out right away. And it gets a lot more expensive to take them out later. And when, when you have things like Norway maples, they're also an invasive and they have a tendency to pop up everywhere and they'll grow, they'll be growing, you know, a foot away from another tree. Well, that's no good. You can't have two uh, large trees growing that close together. So the one you take out, the one that, that you take out should be the non-native in a case like that. So you've taken care of the glaring problems. You're clearing the deck. Now, now the good stuff. Let's talk about assessing what will grow in your yard. These are the factors that are going to define your success. I'm gonna take each of them in turn. We've got soil, light, moisture, time, the hardiness zone, and deer pressure. The soil factor. Testing your soil is a really, really good thing that I, I would do right now if I were you. Now, what is important to think about here is if a lot of people just put fertilizer out and they don't even know if they needed that fertilizer. It's particularly a problem with um, the, the fertili fertilizing uh, element phosphorus. And you may have heard about what phosphorus is doing to the sound, but it's not good. And uh, phosphorus uh, runoff gets into, uh, it, you know, runs out of our gardens, into the gutter, and pretty soon it's in the sound and it creates algae blooms and all kinds of things we don't want. And in fact, it's, it's technically illegal in Connecticut to apply phosphorus uh, as a fertilizer uh, without a soil test or in the case of a new planting, you're allowed to do it then. So this is not, most, um, gardens actually have excessive amounts of phosphorus to begin with. So if you've got something, if you're just randomly adding for a, a combination fertilizer to it, you're probably giving it something it doesn't want, doesn't need, and it's just going to end up in the water supply. So test your soil. Especially important if you're growing a, a new vegetable garden, you want to know what you've got. Also, uh, a new uh, a new flower garden too. It's good to know what you got. Flowers don't need as much fertilizer as, as vegetables do, but unless you test, you do not know. So um, I made a quick little video so without, I'm not going to take you through how you do a soil test here and now because I made a quick little video and you will find it on the Wakeman Town Farm website in their, um, in their how-to videos. And uh, it's, it's easy, it's super easy to do. So I uh, just look it up when you're ready to do your soil test and everything you need to know is right there. Send your sample in. Usually the results come back in two to three weeks and they'll email them to you. And then you follow their directions for amending your soil. Boom, soil solved, answered. I could go on at length about soil. I'm taking whole class on soil science, but I'm gonna uh, right now, but I'll spare you. Uh, this is this is kind of an introductory talk, so I can't go as deep as I would love to do on the subject of compost, for example. So let's move to the light factor. You know, light cannot be faked, and most of the problems we get into in our yards is where we uh, don't have as much light as we think we do. So the light factor, um, light changes dramatically during the growing season, and uh, the key thing is uh, for example, sometimes the light by by the time you get to September, the light has changed a lot, and things that weren't in shadow before are in shadow then. So the question is, do you have enough light to grow the thing that you want to grow in that spot? And it's good to assess what you've got. There is a Sunseeker app that you could put on your phone and um, check it out. Uh, full sun plants require six hours between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So that doesn't mean six hours. You might get great sun starting at 7 a.m. on a summer day, and then the party's over by one. Well, that doesn't count as full sun because that's just morning sun. So that's one of the things that you have to take into account. If, if you've fallen in love with a plant that says it needs full sun 
and you've got barely six hours a day, that plan is never going to be happy. Um, you might want to consider, if you've got a very shady, shady yard, uh, removing uh, a tree, a non-native, to open up a little extra sunlight to your yard so that you can have that beautiful sun uh, uh, garden full of sun loving flowers. That's something that you can, you can think about too now that you're in the planning stages. The moisture factor. So most plants water needs are set by what their natural habitat is. Our natives which belong in this area are used to the amount of rainfall we typically get. They are in sync with our climate. Uh, that said, every plant, uh, nearly every plant, maybe not a cactus, requires extra water when newly planted. You're establishing them, their roots haven't had time to expand into the surrounding area, they're handicapped. So that's the time when even if it says it likes drier soil, when you first get it, you've got to give it some water and, and monitor it. <clears throat> Uh, veg veggies almost always require supplemental water to grow versus other plants. <laughs> they're demanding plants because they're producing a lot of energy. So they require more assistance to get there. <clears throat> Ideally, your flower garden, uh, once established, shouldn't require regular irrigation to prosper. Uh, that's unless you picked a whole bunch of water loving plants then it might need a little extra, but generally it won't need the irrigation coming on every day at uh, 6 a.m., not necessary. This is especially if you have natives. Sunny open areas in sandy soil uh, with a gradient will need more water than for example, a shaded sheltered low lying area will need less. So what have you got in your yard? Take a close look. Are there places where if we get a lot of rain, the water is sometimes puddling up there? Well, that's a clue that that is a moisture area and you can maybe plan on putting moisture loving plants. In general, Connecticut soil is on the sandy side and it drains quite well. That's great for some plants, not so great for others. If it's draining, if it's super sandy, uh, you might need to uh, work in a fair amount of compost to help it hold more water. Organ uh, soil with a lot of organic matter added to it will do a better job at retaining water, which is good. Um, intermittently wet areas, such as one uh, that a downspout is daylighting into, uh, need adaptable plants. So if you hear about people talking about rain garden plants, rain garden plants are plants that can take it when they get flushed with water and they can also take it when it's a little drier. Those are adaptable plants that are, are well suited to a rain garden if you wanted to try that. And sometimes rain gardens can really help you if you've got a lot of water uh, coming off the, the roof of the house. It's, it's clever to put a rain garden in where that runoff is, is daylighting. So that's uh, a good way that you can actually get moisture away from the house and into your plants. Uh, soaking or drip irrigation beats spraying. So if you have the kind of spray heads that are spraying out over a lawn, not so good for flowers. In fact, it'll just weigh them down with water. Just not a good idea. Uh, they may um, develop fung fungal, uh, that, that is kind of creating uh, a recipe for having uh, fungi attack your plants if they never get a chance to dry out. So a, a soaker hose or a drip irrigation, if, if you need something to help you keep your beds watered, those are better because they're getting water down at the roots which need it rather than on the foliage. Uh, if you are do have an irrigation system, I mean, check your zones, watch where the water is going and uh, see if it can be adjusted because uh, if, if you've got a lot of water spray going into a flower bed, that could be problematic. Try to make sure that the intervals that you're watering, it's, it's really better for plants to have deep watering once or twice a week as opposed to little bits 
every day. That little bit every day encourages the roots to hug the surface. And then they're sort of sitting ducks. They need to go deep to get the moisture and nutrients that they need. If they're sitting along the surface, not good. They're not anchored enough. They can blow over in a storm. And also sometimes uh, when winter comes and there's freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing, those plants with those shallow root systems are toast. So for all those reasons, deep watering is better than shallow watering. Um, if you find through your soil test that you have good organic matter in your soil, it'll hold more water naturally, which is great. During extended drought, drought uh, many plants do need some assistance. So I've just told you natives don't need much supplemental watering. However, some of you may remember what happened last June where we got barely a drop of rain the entire month and it was hot. That's not what's supposed to happen in June. And, and any plant uh, was not prepared for that. And uh, we, we were watering things that almost never need watering during that month because, because of uh, the crazy weather. So climate change, unfortunately, is uh, dealing us with some surprises. So you wanna pay attention to the amount of rainfall. It's good to get a simple little rain gauge and put it out someplace in your garden and watch and see if we've got an inch of rain a week, you're golden. If, it has, if, if there's not a drop of water in that rain gauge for the whole week, some things in your garden, the things that are not uh, as drought tolerant may need a little help. So that's just something to keep in mind and newly planted stuff, especially. Okay, the time factor is the next thing. And there's two kinds of time we're talking about here. Great gardens are born in years, not weeks. So it's totally okay to say, this is my goal for this year. For this year, I want to get some more beautiful shrubs so that when I come up the driveway, I see some pretty shrubs rather than some scruffy stuff. That's a great, a, a great goal for a single year. Uh, I mean, most of us are not in a position to be able to replant the entire yard in a year. If you are, great, go to it. But uh, most of us, you want to be realistic and also be realistic about the time you have. In, in many, for many years, I was a working mom and I was lucky if I made it out to the garden two hours a week. So I went for a, very, a small garden that I loved with plants that weren't very high maintenance and uh, that fed my uh, garden needs uh, when I didn't have much time. Um, be realistic, low maintenance exists, but not no maintenance. So if you really are not prepared to do anything but admire your plants from your deck, which is okay. Uh, no judgment here, we all work hard. And if that's all you've got the energy to do, God bless. Uh, checkbook gardening is okay too. So find somebody uh, who uh, gets what you're after and have them help you. There's nothing wrong with that if that gets you to a uh, lovely yard uh, in, in what, in the time that you have available. Smaller gardens are easier and give plenty of joy. And shrubs and grasses provide great benefits, particularly to pollinators, uh, with little care. So that's something to think about. Um, in the picture here, I have uh, viburnum, which is a, a nice tough shrub. It uh, has pretty flowers in the spring and it has a beautiful nutritious berries for the birds in the fall and some of them turn gorgeous red colors in the fall too so that's a good one a good shrub uh, gives gives you a lot of bang for your buck you don't have to do much and um, so this next one is uh, aronia which is another one gorgeous gorgeous fall color gorgeous leaves blooms in the spring um, makes everybody happy actually no this I I might might be a kind of holly, um, but uh, I think it's aronia, uh, chokeberry. And this last one is a beautiful grass called little blue stem, which uh, it has blue green to purple, and uh, it it pollinators love it. And uh, it's it's a great one. And grasses are very little trouble, and you can put a grass like this 
on say a rocky, you know, where you've got a rock ledge coming out or something, you can plant some grass, grasses next to it and they will do just fine. Uh, and lastly, strategically place containers. If nothing else, do a couple containers and put some nice blooming things in those. Enjoy them. It's a, it's a place to start. You can start getting your gardener chops in if you haven't done much before. Next, the hardiness factor. So know your zone. Now, I'm assuming that practically everybody on this call is in Fairfield County. And here in Fairfield County, you'll notice we are on the cusp of two zones, zone six and zone seven. If you are right down by the sound, you are zone seven. Absolutely. Uh, zone six, we always say uh, west of the Merritt has more snow and earlier frost. So, and I have found that in my yard, we're, we're close to the Merritt, more like a zone uh, six sometimes than a zone seven in what will survive uh, in my yard if it's been a really tough winter. So uh, keep that in mind. This is where you uh, definitely want to buy plants whose hardiness matches. Uh, I have a, a dear friend who adores crepe myrtle because she is from Maryland. And crepe myrtle is this very flamboyant uh, blooming flower. And uh, she planted some in her yard up here, didn't make it through the first winter because it is not a uh, zone, um, it is definitely not zone six. It is maybe barely zone 7B, uh, more, really more like zone eight. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, usually uh, the hardiness zone is on the tag, but if it's uh, in the plant shop, but if it's not, it's really easy to look up uh, uh, for a given plant. You just Google type in the plant and, and, the, and say what zone, what zone is mountain laurel and up it comes. Microclimates matter too. I mentioned the West of the Merritt phenomenon, um, but a sunny sheltered spot lets you push your luck. I have a friend who has, she's a very good gardener and she noticed that this area that's right up against her house that's sheltered on three sides, that some of the things that she had, um, you know what elephant ears are, they look very tropical and they don't grow in our zone but she had some of them survived over the winter when she thought they would die because they were so protected in this area. So now she triumphantly grows her elephant ear every, every year there next to her house. She mulches it really well, but she's able to cheat the zone because it's so protected. In general, uh, if you push your zone too hard, you're, you're, you know, you're begging for a disappointment or grow it in a great big container and bring it in someplace to a sunny window over, over the winter and you may survive that way. Um, so uh, the last thing that I uh, have been observing and Texas certainly got a dose of this uh, a couple of weeks ago, they went from, uh, we, climate change means more weather extremes. So yes, we are in zone seven slash six, but uh, we get, we've been getting summers that feel more like a zone eight summer and then a zone six winter in the same place. I mean, that's really what happened in Texas. They had uh, zero degree weather and a few days later, the temperatures were up in the high seventies. Uh, that's whiplash from, um, I was uh, one of my garden professors lives down in Houston and he said half the stuff in my yard is dead because it just couldn't take it. So, so if you get a plant with a big range and that means this plant is happy from zone four to zone eight, you're covered. So that's something to, to think about too. If you're buying a plant that says zone three to six and you're living down by the sound, it might be a little too warm for that plant because three to six means that it's happy up in Canada. So something to keep in mind. Whereas if you get a plant that says it's zone five to zone eight, you're golden. The deer factor. If you have a nice deer fence around your yard, you can tune out for the next two minutes. Uh, but uh, the rest of us, we deal, we're dealing with deer and it's kind of discouraging. They are changing what can grow in our forests. They are 
environmental problem because what's happening is they eat so much of what's growing in the forest, sometimes the thing they're not eating is the alien plant uh, that's poisonous or something, which is not a good plant uh, for, for the open space. So uh, without predators, only cars and starvation can control their population or hunting. I'm just putting that out there. Uh, fence strategically. If no fence is possible, you have to grow defensively. Deer resistant varieties of which I will be giving you some suggestions uh, in the handout uh, and protect new plants. Uh, this is something to keep in mind. You can say, but they said this plant was deer resistant on the website uh, that Alice sent us to and the deer just ate it. Well, that has happened in my yard too. When a plant is brand new, you just brought it home from the nursery, sometimes in the nursery they have been fed extra fertilizer to get them to flush growth so that they look nice. Uh, that young tender growth is most attractive and a deer is browsing and is like, oh, what's new? Something new in the yard and they take, they take a bite or two. Well, uh, the best thing to do is to spray it with an organic deterrent spray uh, when you first plant it to give it a fighting chance till that new fresh new growth hardens off a bit and, um, and the deer won't happen onto it and think it's the latest new dessert. Uh, Naturework.com, it's, it's a nursery in North Fork, has a uh, deer blast reminder email that they send out every three weeks to tell you when to spray because that's how often uh, some of these deterrents have to be sprayed. So uh, you can sign up for their reminder email and they'll tell you it's deer blast day and you go out and you remember and you don't forget to spray on that day. So that's, that's just a tip if you need something to remind you. Okay, having assessed all these factors now, and chosen your goals, time to get planting. So you're gonna plot your spot. If you're putting in a new garden, you wanna lay out the area your new plantings will go. You can stake it out with twine if it's, if it's a rectangular shape, or if you're planting an irregular shape, it's good to use a hose to just lay out the contours to help mark what, what you're planning to do. And then you can plot those dimensions. Uh, I included this is in your handout, but there's a site where you can download a garden plan worksheet, all handy, ready to go, print it out, and you've got your grid. And um, note the conditions of this site you picked out, uh, what, what you're gonna keep, weeds to eliminate, um, calculate the square footage. Now, if you've got it on this sheet, you can kind of go through and say, okay, a square is a foot or, or four squares or four feet, and you just go out and count them. And then you know what your total square area is. And that really helps you calculate how much you're going to need, not just you might calculate, uh, calculate how much cop compost, if it says it covers two, you know, if it's two cubic feet or whatever, it helps you know how much you've got. If you're putting down compost, you want to put down an inch or two of compost as a top dressing. Preparing the stage. Site prep is really, really important. Uh, don't overlook this step. It's, if you are planting a garden where you have lawn, scalp the lawn. Uh, turf grass has shallow root system. So if you kind of get in under it with a shovel, you can scrape off that top layer. Almost it's like reverse sodding, if you will. Uh, but you want to get those roots out because they will come back and back and back. You'll be root weeding grass, seed, grass uh, shoots out of your bed forever. So you won't, don't want to do that. Rototilling is, has, um, soil science now knows rototilling ain't so great. Uh, for soil, it breaks down uh, these very essential structures and mycorrhizae that are in the soil. Uh, you do want to lose, if the soil is very compacted, say that there was maybe a play set on top of that area, you want to loosen the compacted soil, uh, get in there with a, 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 lawn, a, a fork, uh, a pitchfork, a broad fork, and just wiggle it around, just loosen that soil right up. Um, remove the weeds and work in the compost. Uh, the compost is going to make the weeds very happy, so remove the weeds first. Um, by that time, you should have your soil test information back, do any amendments that they recommend, follow their directions, and if you're in a bed which already has some plants, 
uh, that maybe some of them gotten overgrown. Um, dig them up, edit, divide. Maybe you just have, I had one garden where there was a really nice plant growing in it, um, uh, uh, foxglove, but it had gotten uh, a little over enthusiastic. So I dug up half of it and gave it to a happy friend and uh, replaced the others to sort at, and so that it was spread through the garden and it was a very valuable piece of editing. Add mulch. Chopped leaves, if you have some left over from the fall, are really great mulch. They're free. They're fantastic at adding organic matter to the soil. And uh, uh, don't buy the mulch that has been tinted different colors. Uh, that is, you, they're using a petroleum substance to do that uh, uh, tint, so don't do that. Okay, now explore your plant options. Um, there will be some suggestions in the um, uh, handout and uh, uh, Scout Native Plant Sales, I wanna do a shout out. Aspatuck is having a really nice uh, native plant sale. Go to Aspatuck Land Trust and check out their native plant sale. Uh, you can use online tools and books to curate your list. Again, that's gonna be in, in the handout. I've got some great suggestions. And um, we don't steal in gardening, we borrow, but boy, do we borrow. So any place that has a, a uh, design ideas. There's a, a blog I get called Gardenista, uh, which has a, an email with lovely, lovely design ideas, and you can scroll through their blog and get ideas. Screen for your limiting factors. So as you're looking at plants, uh, there are a lot of tools so you can plug in deer resistant, and, and what will come up is deer resistant or pollinator friendly, um, that kind of thing in timing, early, mid, and late bloomers. So you're gonna look at your garden and you're gonna say, do I have nothing blooming in August onward? Or do I have, you know, what do I have? If, if you're just brand new to the garden, you may have to look it up um, or try to get a picture of it when it was blooming last summer. But uh, um, it's certainly in what you're gonna add, you wanna make sure you have early, mid, and late bloomers because it's really important to have a continuous sequence of bloom for pollinators. Scale is important, so you want to know, you want to have a mix of short, medium, and tall plants to balance each other. Keep the, keep your favorite colors in mind and know the spacing the plants require. There's a great pollinator plant called Joe Pie, very high value plant, but it gets wide and tall. So that big boy goes at the back of your garden. Those are the kind of things you want to know about your plants. So here's some suggestions. Uh, for a full sun garden, this is an array. You could have nothing but these guys and you would be happy, happy, happy. Uh, if you had a full sun garden, this is a nice array of the early guys, the mid guys and the late guys. And I pick things which are known to be deer resistant. You might have a deer in your yard who thinks otherwise, but at least it's a fighting chance. So if you have a part sun garden, and that means that you can't quite get to six hours of sunlight. Uh, doesn't mean no sunlight, but we're really talking in, in maybe the, the three to six hour zone for these guys. Uh, and uh, they, you know, they say that they take um, part sun. So uh, give them a try, but be realistic and be honest about how much sun you really have. So when I say, maybe three hours, that can't be from seven to 10 um, in the morning. You need a little bit more than that. So you kind of got to scope it out and you might have a little spot that gets a little bit more sun than something else. So put, put the one that, that is maybe a part sun, uh, but not a uh, part shade lover and put it there. So anyway, these are plants that will do well in spaces like that and typically do not get hit hard by the deer. So enjoy them, and uh, but know their heights because some of these guys, uh, the uh, Vernonia gets tall, the Joe Pie gets tall, the, um, um, the Anis, uh, the Agastici funiculum, Anis hyssop gets pretty tall. Um, so that's just something you wanna keep in mind as you're researching your plants that you wanna get. Recommended planting sources. These are in your handout. These are some terrific places to start. This great little guide, Native Plants for Small Yards, has 
actual garden designs using natives with layouts for small yards. You could just borrow one of those. Uh, Heather Holm is a wonderful expert on bees. She has tons and tons of PDFs for different combinations of flowers uh, that go grow well in different soils. As I mentioned uh, here in, in Connecticut, we mostly have soil that's on the sandy side, not the clay side. So pick, pick those sheets to go by. And then there are all these others. And wildflower.org, you can sort by what by state, Connecticut recommended uh, uh, collections. Uh, Yukon has a great horticultural site, which will tell you all about plants and how to take care of them. And uh, prairiemoon.com, I mean, they are a commercial uh, mail order uh, place, but they have a, a blog and a lot of uh, fat, good factual sheets. Kim Ironman is a local expert on natives and she has a wonderful site called Eco Beneficial and great blogs. And the National Wildlife Federation has a native plant finder that uh, partnered with Doug Tallamy, also excellent. So those are places to look. Mapping your choices. Remember how I told you where to get a grid? So you've downloaded your grid, you're gonna take your curated wish list and you're gonna pencil in the plants. This, what looks like a hot mess down here is actually a pretty good way to go about it. So in the first column, if you see my uh, pointer moving around, the first column handwritten in here were the early blooming plants. The next column was the mid blooming plants and the last one was the late blooming plants. So they were kind of stacked and then they each had their little code um, and how many, and, and this helped figure out how many to buy. And then this is, this is each square was a foot. So uh, the JPs, that's the Joe Pie. Remember I mentioned those were big plants. So those plants had a lot of, were given a lot of room, but the tinier plants that were up in the front, like the Tiarella, which is an adorable plant, um, could be planted more closely together. So this is a pretty ambitious pollinator garden set up here. This is a much more realistic one up here, a uh, smaller garden, but you can see how they did it with, with uh, um, they had a, co a code and they went at it. This will really help you figure out how many plants you need and, uh, um, and also where to put them so that they don't end up spending too much time sitting in the driveway. So you've got it all figured out. Uh, plugs, you may have heard of plugs. Plugs is what you can get from the native plant sale at Aztec Land Trust. They're very cost effective. Uh, they take a little longer to reach bloom size, but um, they catch up pretty fast. And they're a really great way to go if you've got a lot of area to plant and you don't wanna um, go broke. Uh, Container grown plants though fill in faster. So I usually try to do some plug, some container grown plants because uh, then you get a greater sense of accomplishment a little sooner, makes us gardeners happy. Okay, uh, shipped plants. If you do buy some online, rather than going to the local nursery, be aware, you know, shipping weight costs. So you will get less size for the same money when you're ordering a plant online because they just can't afford to ship a bigger plant. So the container grown plants that you can pick up locally are gonna be a heftier size for your money. Okay, I promised you, you would get to go shopping. And here it is, uh, almost eight o'clock, I made it to shopping. So um, it's, uh, I, I hope to see you at the nursery. And uh, I want to give a shout out here for uh, nurseries in the area who are really good at helping, uh, helping you with native plants. Uh, there is a Gilberti's Herb Garden and Joe Gloria is in the perennials department and he uh, can point you straight to uh, the natives and give you some advice. Another great resource is natives. Um, uh, it is a all native nursery on um, Redding in Fairfield. So you go straight up cross highway and take a left on Redding to get there. And Harry Spears at uh, Native will help you out. And um, there is also uh, 
Oliver's uh, has beautiful places uh, to get ideas from in their demonstration gardens. And they also, uh, they carry both natives and non-natives, uh, but uh, they, they have great knowledgeable help as well. So those are some good places to go looking besides the Aspetuck Land Trust native plant sale. And uh, um, I, I know that the, the shopping is really fun. And the great thing is, is when you get home now, you know exactly uh, what, what you're gonna do with what you bought. So um, that's, uh, that's my talk and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you so much, Alice. Wow, you pack so much into <laughs> such a short amount of time. Um, and I have to say that I really do, if it weren't dark outside, I would be running outside to start playing in the garden. Um, so we don't have any questions as of right now, but if anybody does have a question, we still have a little bit of time. So um, you can- Somebody's test. raised a hand and there's something in chat, I see. I let's... The chat is mine. Um, oh, okay. So that's, <laughs> yeah, don't worry about that. We, um, whoever raised their hand, if you could just type your question into the Q&A section down at the bottom of your screen, then we can get to it. Um, we do have a, one comment. Uh, the owners of Copia in Lewisboro, just outside of New Canaan, went to uh, Cornell, which as we know is a great agricultural school, uh, and believe that there are ways to solve the boxwood blight. Um, this person had a friend who sought advice from them, and so there might be a way to get around the boxwood blight. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, Oliver's doesn't sell boxwood anymore because of the problems with it, but they do advise it is possible to do a spraying program. Uh, however, since boxwood isn't a native anyway, and uh, uh, spraying programs can be expensive, and uh, I, whenever anybody talks about spraying, uh, I say, no, uh, read the warning label and know what you're getting into. Uh, as part of the pollinator pathway, we say refrain from spraying, and that's uh, because there, there's almost nothing that doesn't kill something beneficial while it's killing the thing you don't want. So it's better to have plants that can are strong enough to resist on their own rather than to be constantly trying to help them with chemicals. Mm. So that leads us to our next question that um, Roshni says, I need to spray because of significant ticks. Can you recommend a safe but highly effective pesticide or some other way to handle ticks? Well, um, if you go to pollinator-pathway.org, they have a section explaining um, more organic ways of dealing with ticks. And I, I will say that uh, if you have a tick problem, first thing to do is make sure you have no barberry in your yard, get rid of it. And uh, uh, because that's, you're, you're encouraging ticks. And um, we don't spray in our yard. We don't spray at the farm. We don't have tick issues there. Um, and nor do we, I don't have guinea fowl eating my ticks either. I'm in the yard all the time and I haven't had a tick on me in many years. And I, when I did, it was because I was bushwhacking in devil's den, not because I was in my backyard. So uh, there are natural ways to prevent ticks. Ticks don't like sunlight. Uh, they, uh, if you keep, anyway, there's a lot of advice on the pollinator pathway site on how to avoid it, but it, uh, garlic oil is about the only thing, uh, there is a garlic spray, that's the only thing that looks, uh, if, if, when you read the, the uh, warning labels, that's the one that didn't scare me, but um, be aware that any spray will kill uh, something uh, beneficial as well as something that you don't want. Mm. Um, so she said, thank you. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you for telling me about the boxwoods because for some reason in my head, I was thinking that those would be fine for this one area in my yard. And now I'm rethinking that portion of my yard because I, I don't wanna have to deal with things dying unnecessarily. Um, 
Yeah, there's so, nothing more heartbreaking than to have some newly planted thing turn up brown the next year. I know, I know, and because we've all had it happen. So <laughs> thank you all for coming and for this evening. Um, and thank you for hanging out with us a little bit longer than the one hour. Um, keep a lookout in your email for the handouts that Alice has mentioned. I will be sending those out at some point tomorrow. So uh, just be patient. I promise you, I will send them. Um, for more gardening and nature advice, check out Wakeman Town Farm, obviously. And the Westport Library website also has resource guides about gardening and the pollinators as well. So look, look at both spots because I'm sure that we overlap, but there's probably things on the Wakeman Town Farm website that we don't have. We also have um, more programs coming up both at Wakeman and the Westport Library about gardening. And in the past year, we have I know we've all recorded quite a few. So definitely check out those recordings for any other information that you might need. And thank you, Alice, for imparting such wisdom with us again today. Thanks for having me, Jan. It was, it was so much fun. Thanks. Good night, Good everybody. Good luck with your garden. <laughs>